Hi, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Brittany Kavinsky. It is now 1 p.m., so we will begin our presentation shortly. Today, on Friday, July 12th, we will have our presentation on multimodal wayfinding, given by Aidan Jamison, David Figueroa, Carrie Tyler, and Mike Rawlinson. For help during today's webcast, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call 1-800-263-6317. For content questions, please feel free to type those in the questions box and we will be able to answer those at the end of the presentation during the question and answer session. Here's a list of the sponsoring chapters, divisions, and universities. I would like to thank all the participating chapters, divisions, and universities for making these webcasts possible, as well as the Transportation Planning Division for sponsoring today's webcast. As you can see, we have quite a few webcasts planned for the next month or two. Um, to register for any of these upcoming webcasts, please visit www.utah-apa.org slash webcasts and register for your webcast of choice. You can also follow us on Twitter at Planning Webcast or like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on the Planning Webcast Series sponsored by chapters, divisions, and universities. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to www.planning.org slash CM and select today's date, which is Friday, July 12th, and then select today's webcast, which is Multimodal Wayfinding. This webcast is available for one and a half CM credits. We are also recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel later today. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube. A PDF of the PowerPoint will be made available upon request. And at this time, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. Um, Aiden Jamison is a project leader at Billings Jackson Design, managing projects in the New York City office. Aiden joined Billings Jackson in 1999 and has since worked as a product designer with particular expertise in transportation projects and lighting systems. Mike Rawlinson is a founding director of City ID and a design planner. He has led the development and delivery of innovative, groundbreaking design projects and strategies, the quality of which is demonstrated through their legacy. As well as wayfinding projects, he has extensive experience working on master planning, streetscape design, public art, information systems, transportation, city identity, and legibility projects. In particular, Mike is credited with developing legible cities concept pioneered in Bristol and now extending to a number of cities in UK and Europe which seeks to improve people's understanding and experience of cities and destinations through the implementation of identity, wayfinding, and integrated transportation projects. Mike has led design teams working on identity, wayfinding, and transportation projects for major cities and regions in the UK and internationally, including Bath, Birmingham, Bristol, Dublin, Legible London, London 2012, Mazdar City in Abu Dhabi, New York City, Newcastle, Rio de Janeiro, Sheffield, and Southampton. David Figueroa is a cartographer and geographer with many years of implementation and consulting experience with GIS development, information design, and cartographic system implementation. Since 2000, his primary focus has been the application of cartography and GIS to public transport information, developing some of the world's leading examples of sustainable data-driven mapping for urban mobility and public transit. Among a number of organizations, David has developed and led projects for include um, including Transport for London, the New York City Develop Department of Transportation, and the South Yorkshire Public Transport Executive. Carrie Tyler is the Senior Project Manager for the Walk NYC Wayfinding Program for the New York City Department of Transportation. Her background is transportation planning with a focus on the pedestrian realm. I'd also like to introduce Gabriela Juarez, who is going to talk about the Transportation Planning Division. Hello, everyone. I am the webinar coordinator for the Transportation and Planning Division, and I was so inspired by today's topic that I decided to find my way through Disneyland as we do this webinar. So I apologize for all the background noise, but sometimes that's just the kind of devoted planners we have to be. I want to thank our panelists and Carrie Tyler and the City of New York particularly for being so gracious and offering us this wonderful wayfinding topic, and I'm really excited that we got to do it. I really know that they're setting a high bar, and I know that you're sitting at home thinking how I can also be a part of that. So when you are ready to submit your topic, please let me know, and I'll be happy to help coordinate uh, your new future transportation planning webinar for our division. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it on 
back to Brittany to coordinate, and feel free to contact me as you come up with these great ideas for new topics. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Gabriella. We're also going to um, quickly just launch a poll. The um, presenters are interested in learning what organizations you represent, so go ahead and um, choose which organization best represents where you work. And so right now we have about 75% of the votes in and 67% of our attendees today work in general planning, 31% um, are in transportation planning, and 2% work for a transit agency. And so with that I'm going to hand it over to Mike who's going to begin the presentation. Thank you very much, Brittany. Okay, uh, multimodal wayfinding. Um, we've been working in this area of work now or business for some time and uh, this presentation is really split into three or four parts. The first being kind of an introduction to the subject in many ways. Uh, there's also some case studies, particularly from the UK. And then I'm going to hand over to Kerry Tyler that's going to introduce a fascinating project that's underway in New York City. Uh, she'll introduce that project and then hand back to me and we'll talk about the system development, at which point I'm going to introduce two of our team members, David and Aidan as well. And then we're going to finish on just some kind of basic principles and, and take home points. So without further ado, I'll move on. So kind of wayfinding is really about navigation, how people orientate themselves, how people find their way in cities and different environments. And crucially, it's not just about wayfinding within streets and spaces. It's about within transit systems themselves. And the fact, I think, at the heart of all of this, we're all walkers, we're all pedestrians at some part of our movement experience. So crucially, uh, wayfinding should really start to aid your experience of moving through in two cities, using different modes of transport. But the glue behind it all is the information within the wayfinding system that helps to stitch that journey experience together for you. So there's a number of projects that are happening worldwide, and invariably these are called legible cities, basically about improving people's understanding and experience of places and they're starting to redefine how we experience cities and experience transport systems as a means of enjoying things. So the approach, um, really movement's at the heart of cities, it's how they've grown, it's how they've developed, but movement is basically a, not a means to an end, it's, it's, it's a way of engaging with a city, it ties into its public realm in particular, and also to its overlaying, overlaying information systems with the aim of giving, giving life and activity to places. And I think the important thing here is not to design a wayfinding system that's separate from the public realm or separate from the movement system in terms of bus, rapid transit, tram systems, subway systems. It's about gluing that whole experience together. And there's measurable benefits in co-planning and co-designing uh, and co-executing this type of project, which we'll show you. Um, the approach is also about user needs and mirroring those user needs. And, and people are generally the time poor or time rich or somewhere in between. Some people want to be instructed about how to get from A to B. Others just want to explore, even get lost. It's all fine. So it's not one size fits all. We're not designing for one type of user or one type of person with one type of ability. We've got to be careful to design for different needs and for different circumstances. So again, we're looking at a more of a complex project where we're designing new information types to suit different needs and different journey experiences, from those that are very highly managed around itineraries to those that are unmanaged and self-guided where people are following uh, their own devices, their own guides, their own way of navigating through cities. And we're also seeing trends moving from just the design of systems around single modes to multimodal to now what's called intermodal. When I'll explain this in a bit more detail. So previously we used to design for separate modes, whether you be a taxi user or a rail user or a bus user. Um, and now we're designing to provide information about your modal choices. 
And intermodal systems, as they emerge, are really about starting to give the user the appropriate travel choices at any stage in their journey. So they can choose to walk or ride or get a bus or get a taxi or get the subway, for instance. Um, so it's about co-designing that information and presenting it in the most simple way to give the user the most appropriate travel choice from any given location on their journey experience. And we're also seeing different tools being used, different medium, from pre-journey planning on the web through to print-based products, through to mobile products, as well as on-street information systems themselves. So we can design a set of information types to work from your at-home experience and, and navigating online right the way through consistently through to interchanging or transferring from buses to walking to different forms of transport through to being a pedestrian. And the key to this, the glue to this, is how that expression for movement is designed as a single information brand to tie that whole journey experience together. So in terms of best practice, the whole idea of kind of uh, wayfinding and particularly legible cities um, really emerged in the UK now about 15 years ago in Bristol. And the projects in Bristol have subsequently been copied or at least been developed by other cities as well. I'm going to show you a couple of these now. So Bristol, as I said, started about 15 years ago. And it spanned um, a whole host of projects, about 40 different projects, from improving uh, user and visitor experience and the transport user experience in the city through uh, information design, through to public arts projects, through to things like street naming, car park signing, new public space projects. And they span the whole mode of transport. And this shows you a timeline from going back to 1994 when the project had its early kind of genesis around reconnecting and stitching different parts of the city together. And as I said, it followed through to a whole kind of design vocabulary spanning uh, parks, uh, spanning walking, cycling, bus transit, taxis, and other products, all related to a consistent identity as to how the city was read and understood by people. And um, part of this was based on the idea of how can we systemize and join together what's necessary for people to make uh, the most of the transport choices in the city. So how can we glue together the city through a unique graphic identity and hence uh, a blue concept to merge with a unique typeface for the city that link together all the various points of touch that the user needs to, to, uh, to, to get from A to B. So whether it's pedestrian signs or print or mobile apps or real-time information systems, bus shelters, they're all designed in a certain way to stitch together the system together. Uh, to show up easily for users. The foil to that was actually saying, well, not all the system, system has to be designed in exactly the same way. And the idea of using light, art, poetry, and other devices as forms of expression on the journey were also factored in to the way we designed Bristol Legible City. Um, the key drivers behind the project was a, a huge level of regeneration, uh, new forms of transport, the idea of stitching together the city's streets and spaces, to animate the environment and then look at how information could overlay on top of that uh, to enable people to interpret and access and find out what's going on. The project had, its, had it at its heart was this idea of, of connecting the major regeneration areas. How we did that was by connecting streets and spaces and redesigning those streets and spaces, as I said, to stitch together the various quarters and districts of the city together. And this was very successful. There's about 30 or 40 uh, particular streetscape projects were introduced. So all the areas in yellow here are new spaces that were designed to connect the primary route structure together in the city uh, to reinforce the idea that it's good to walk and it's good to use uh, public transport uh, and to get people to get out of their car once they're in that city centre environment. So it resulted in things like new bridge crossings and new uh, pedestrian walkways. Uh, public art and new public space design, as well as product design for the various modes of transport in the city, all part of a kit of parts and a family or suite of elements that were brought together. And all of this was planned around a series of blue routes or the blue network as it's called, uh, with products uh, introduced in the city at a scale that's never been seen before up until that time in a UK city. It also had its own graphic language. Uh, from pictograms to, uh, as I said, typography, uh, resulted in uh, a complete 
sit of system of, of new print products with that graphic language being applied for the first time to what we call forward facing or heads up mapping. Basically the, the maps that you see in front of you mirror the view that you have in front of you as well. So it's very much like the sat nav system for a car. But you've got to remember this was done 15 years ago. It's very, very groundbreaking. Still uh, very contemporary and very legible in terms of the way these were designed. And that shows you an example. London then really learned from, from Bristol um, and developed Legible London. And obviously Legible London is quite well known as an international benchmark. And it followed through to expand it to, to products such as uh, bike share within the city. So not only did it introduce pedestrian wayfinding, but it followed through to, to other products and services. And these are examples to show you the mapping. And particularly, we worked on projects for the Olympics, where we started to combine the idea of walking and cycling routes together and generated new products for those that went in for the Olympic Games and stitched together a whole series of green work, greenways, leisure uh, routes, and canal network into the, uh, into the system. And all of this was possible through the work of uh, people like T. Carter, who obviously part of the New York team, and we'll introduce David soon that really started to produce a master base map for, for the whole system that could be used then as a single design resource to populate into tube and subway uh, into various different print products and services as well as bus stops and journey planner tools as well. So kind of the design resource is really at the heart of a project like this. And uh, that design resource has been able to populate and, and produce uh, thousands of products and services from, as I said, bus stop maps to uh, walking maps to uh, subway to underground uh, information as well as the new products of the Olympics. And indeed the same system was used to generate all the communications and material that were used during the very successful 2012 Games in London. Now Birmingham has taken arguably a step further again and this is the last of my UK case studies. Um, it's had a similar basis to Bristol in terms of generating a unique graphic language and vocabulary for wayfinding within the city. But it's done it in what we call an open source way, where all the data is collected and is free of use for different users within the city environment. And it's spawned a whole series of products from uh, arrival points at major train stations, to the metro system, to the bus system, to the walk environment, as well as buses. So it's very comprehensive in its scale. The mapping is very simple, uh, very focused on the pedestrian in terms of its scale. It's richly detailed for walking, shows things like building entrances, uh, building numbers, crossing points, underpasses, all the things that typically you don't see in city scale mapping at uh, this level. Way in advance of Google and uh, Bing mapping at this point in time, for instance. And these are showing you the examples of how various scales of mapping work. And we've also designed into looking, as I said, at, at interiors of buildings, interiors of major arrival points, train stations, for instance. And these show you some of the products that are emerging on the street. The lighter products are for the walking. The darker products on the right are all backlit uh, for use um, for the bus system and the tram system in the city. And we've done a lot of assessment around um, kind of multimodal wayfinding for bus use to develop new types of information for bus and tram users. Here I'm standing the network on the left to show you on the right how we design new information products and these have resulted in products on street uh, including uh, digital and real-time information systems as well. Um, very contemporary in their design. Um, all remotely controlled in terms of information feeds to these products. And it's resulted in a kind of a wider system of new print products, new network maps, new uh, bus stop finder maps, those sorts of things, as well as the business improvement districts also using the same system to provide their own information, as well as the city uh, council itself. It's the largest council in Europe, in fact. And here again is an example from a business improvement district. Repurposing the identity and some of the content and some of the material to partly reflect their own look and feel and their own brand identity. And latterly, the project's now being developed for touchscreen use and for digital applications, all using this common suite of products and graphic language and identity that's emerged for the product. 
Now, this kind of whole way of designing information to improve the user experience of transit systems and, and cities themselves is also now of international interest. And New York in particular is a city that's picked up on this and has learned from London and Bristol and other projects. And I'm going to hand over to Kerry now to talk about uh, what is an amazing project that's taking place in New York City, commissioned by the Department of Transport involving Penn to City Group, which is part of the team uh, that, that bid for that work. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Kerry now. Thanks, Mike, very much. Um, so we, New York City DOT in New York City, we're very proud to introduce uh, Walk NYC. Um, very delighted that we have developed this sophisticated um, system citywide information wayfinding system for residents, visitors, commuters, for everyone. Um, let's see, I'm having trouble moving the slide here. Oh. Um, let's see. Um, sorry, Brittany, um, the slides aren't moving. Is there? Carrie, just go ahead and click on the GoToWebinar viewer, and it should let you start moving through them. Oh, okay. You just have to click on on like on his slides. There you go. Now now you can move through. Okay. Sorry. I apologize for the delay. Um, okay. So, whoa. I got this a little fast. So New York City um, is you know probably a lot of planners in the audience um, have heard our story and. Um, the great improvements that we've been making to the street environment under the leadership of Mayor Bloomberg and Commissioner Jeanette Sadek Khan, um, we've been rapidly transforming the streets of New York City, um, you know, with the focus on increasing uh, street capacity, actually, and uh, for transit riders, um, we've been introducing bus-only lanes, uh, select bus service, which is our version of bus rapid transit. Um, to increase, you know, movement of people over vehicles. Um, and we've introduced um, many pedestrian and bicycle safety improvements. Um, we have protected bike lanes, protected green bike lanes all over the city now. Um, we've increased uh, public space. Um, we have a wonderful plaza program. And we've been... Um, you know, really paying attention to the needs of all street users, not just drivers. And um, one of the, let's see. and then of course we're also known as a city. Whoa, sorry about this. I'm having some problems and delays. Um, we're known as a city of tourists and walkers. Um, we have, you know, probably more tourists than any other city in the world. Um, we continually, you know, have record numbers of visitors. And while we're synonymous with walking, and most of our visitors are, you know, walking um, when they're here, we still have improvements to make to the pedestrian realm. And wayfinding information is an important ad addition to help pedestrians feel that their needs are considered equal to drivers and other street users. So the origin of the program, um, we do have some existing uh, wayfinding systems, but in reality, most of them are retail or district branding. Um, and we continue to have demand from business improvement districts and from cultural institutions um, who want to develop their own branded information systems. But um, the city really just wanted one standardized system that provides the right information in the right place and not just a branding opportunity for an individual institution or um, neighborhood. And so to solve this issue, uh, we commissioned a study in 2012 to determine um, the best way to move forward and kind of figure out, you know, what issues we need to address with this. And, uh, you know, many of the findings will not be surprising to you um, that most people, even, even locals, are getting lost um, probably, you know, more than they admit. Um, you know, it's very confusing. We have a clashing street grid. 
Um, when you come out from the subway, you know, you, ha you may have no idea which, you know, corner you're standing on. It's very difficult um, sometimes to determine which direction is north. Um, and so we, we found that we definitely did have a gap. Um, you know, people can't give directions. It's, you know, New Yorkers love to give directions, but they're not always correct. So that's definitely an issue. And then there's also the issue of neighborhoods. This is very contentious. There's not really an official city map of neighborhoods. People have, you know, very different ideas. Um, real estate agents are continually changing um, neighborhood names. So um, this was something else that we wanted to address, kind of standardizing areas um, to stop that confusion. Okay, and then oh, in addition, you know, the, there isn't sort of one high quality map product that visitors or residents are using. Um, in fact, many of them are using the subway map and that, you know, that's certainly not an ideal way to navigate the city. Um, but it's interesting to note that you know, most people aren't necessarily using their smartphones to navigate. So you know, that's definitely like a response. A lot of people think that you, know, you shouldn't bother developing a wayfinding system because you know, everyone has a phone and they're all using Google Maps. And you know, that's definitely not true. And then we think you know, we're, we're continually wanting to um, reduce reliance on automobiles and um, you know, encourage people to take other um, modes of transportation and, and with information, with a, a really high quality wayfinding information system on the street, we think that that will um, encourage people to walk more. So um, we wanted to uh, develop a system, but first we needed to find the money to do so. So we are uh, we applied for a bunch of federal grants, um, and, and that was very good. The FTA is um, very uh, supportive of this. They see this as a good way to increase um, bus ridership as well as um, walking. And so, and then we worked with our partners to secure some additional funding. Some of our partners were able to secure federal 9-11 recovery funds. Um, and then we were able to attract some city capital dollars from local, affected, or local elected officials. Um, and then some of our business improvement districts um, brought their own private money um, to the table as well. And then we're continuing to look for additional funds um, as well as considering some other maybe sponsorship opportunities um, with private money to continue rolling out the system. And our phase one partners are, uh, we have Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn. And we have uh, three business improvement districts in Manhattan, one in Queens. Um, and then in Brooklyn, we're working with cultural organizations. Um, and all of, you know, they all got on board early. They were all interested. They either have existing wayfinding that they wanted to upgrade or they were interested in developing their own systems. And so you know, they were eager to be a part of this first phase and get in on the ground level. And they also you know, nicely represent the various types of street networks and neighborhood uses. You know, we have the Midtown Grid um, with a lot of office use. Um, we have Long Island City, which is becoming, you know, it uh, was industrial. And it's kind of, while still industrial, also transitioning to being more of an art district, um, as well as a lot of a hotel districts. A lot of visitors are coming. Um, Chinatown, um, you know, very unique for the city and draws a lot of um, visitors. And not to mention it's off the grid. Um, and Long Island City as well kind of has a clashing grid happening. And then Prospect Heights and Crown Heights in Brooklyn are, um, you know, the home to some famous cultural institutions, but also um, a largely residential area. Uh, and so these, you know, all worked really well for being the, uh, uh, to develop our system that, that works, you know, truly citywide. Um, and our, for the, fa for the development of the system, we had our partners um, involved from the very beginning. So they were part of um, a technical advisory committee. And 
Uh, you know, they, they led area walking tours to identify issues and opportunities, um, you know, to provide their local knowledge and expertise. And they participated in content planning workshops um, for developing the map and our content criteria. Um, and they also, you know, reviewed locations with us. Um, and so that was it's been a really good collaborative process to have different voices um, and different people from different parts of the city involved in um, influencing the design outcome. So you can see there's just some images from workshops that we've held. Um, so we also want to extend the system. Um, obviously, this, is, uh, this workshop is about multimodal uh, wayfinding. And we, back in May, we launched um, City Bike, New York City's bike share program, finally. Um, after a little bit of a delay, but we're very excited that the, our maps are included in, at all of the city bike stations, and so um, there is an you know, immediate connection to the pedestrian system. The difference here is that we're also including the bike lanes um, and some other um, bike-related information for people, but pedestrians can use this, and they are. It's proven very popular. We're seeing you know, the maps are getting a lot of use. Um, by people who will never use the city bike system. So it was a double benefit to have these on the street. So we launched, um, officially launched the wayfinding program um, this month. And um, we're very, very excited. And here's just a nice um, shot of one of the first signs. And in Chinatown, we have just four installed, and the rest of the system um, will be installed uh, later this month and throughout August. We'll get the first four signs out. And then we are working to um, expand the system into lower Manhattan, uh, up into the Bronx, and um, further north in Midtown along the 42nd Street corridor. And then as well, you'll see some images uh, later. You'll get a sneak peek of a design that we're developing for select bus service stations that will be a wayfinding product that also includes real-time bus information. So like immediately getting into the multimodal uh, connections there. And then we also see, oh, sorry, we are also working with New York City Transit to um, introduce the maps in subway stations to replace their existing neighborhood maps. So when you get off the subway, um, you'll see the maps in the mezzanine. And then when you come up on the street, you'll be able to connect that with the street the network on the street. And so it just continues through various modes. And then we are looking for future opportunities to, uh, oops, to add um, you know, maps to existing street furniture. Um, here's just an example. We have cycling maps out in some of our covered um, bike parking units, and we could you know, replace this map with our wayfinding map for cyclists. And so we're looking for other opportunities to do that. And then we're also developing criteria to allow our partners and um, other organizations, including New York City and Company, um, which is our a tourist organization um, to produce products tailored to their needs using our uh, base map. So, you know, if if a tourist is in a in 34th Street partnership area and they want a retail guide, um, they can you know pick up a retail guide and it will it will look like the map that they see out on the street, um, but it will have you know more detailed information. So we're very excited to be developing that. So thanks very much for your interest in our program and our system. And I hope you all come visit New York City and uh, use our signs. Um, and I'll turn back to Mike now. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. I can't wait to come back out, Kerry. So, <laughs> um, OK. Kerry's really talked about the focus there, moving from or evolving a pedestrian system to uh, to starting to think about bike share, but also the idea of other travel modes and the fact that we can stitch these things together. So there's been a team behind this. We've worked very closely with DOT, and DOT have been amazing in terms of their vision and direction for the project, but also the impetus they've given to it 
in terms of directing us to deliver within a certain time frame and certain budgets. Now we've worked uh, with a team called Penta City Group that's put together for the project. It involves Pentagram graphic designers. It involves City Ideas lead designers for the project in terms of developing the overall strategy, the planning and much of the design direction to the whole project working across uh, graphics, product design and mapping. Uh, we've worked with RBA Group from New York um, to actually look at the uh, strategy for location for the planning of the system itself. And uh, not least Billings Jackson in terms of uh, product design and street furniture. And then lastly, T. Carter. Um, and again, all these companies are based in New York as well as elsewhere. T. Carter are based in Sweden and New York. But they're very much the specialists. They're the people that are, are bringing the delivery of the mapping system to life, basically and developing the automated outputs that are enabling us to turn out hundreds of products in, in double quick time now. So there was a key word that, that DOT introduced into the brief, and it's the word standardized. And this has been a, a blessing, really, because it's enabled us to think about introducing one system or one uh, design idea that we can execute across the entirety of New York. Uh, what it will do is replace the various thiefdoms of, of different wayfinding systems that aren't co-joined or co-designed in any particular way. Indeed, they're quite dysfunctional because they don't join up. They don't stitch the journey experience together. And by introducing this word standardize, it means we can obviously standardize information not just for, for walkers, but also for bus users, for subway users, and others, uh, ferry users as well, and other modes of transport in due course. So we can give a degree of consistency to it. We can introduce a, a visual language that stitches it all together. And it's more simple and cost effective to maintain because we're talking about economies of scale here. We're producing more that drives down costs over time. And it also means we can create a set of resources that can be shared with different partners that Kerry alluded to. So all these things are part and parcel of building a standardized system. And Part of that is if we're introducing the same system, no matter where you are in New York City, from the Bronx to Long Island City to Prospect Heights to Chinatown, you're meted and greeted very much by the same products and services, no matter where you are. So it breeds a sense of familiarity. It breeds a sense that the information is designed as being fit for purpose, that it's provided for you in an authentic manner, that somebody is managing the system itself. So. They're all key components of, of building a standardized system. And what that starts to do is for the, the infrequent user, the first time user, is to turn them more into walkers every day and public transport users every day by greeting them, as I said, with consistent high quality information that's consistently applied no matter where they are in their journey trip or, or journey experience. So we call it building mental maps. If we can convince people that the information that we're providing for them is good to use and that it encourages walking and use of public transport and bike share systems. It will encourage them to explore more, explore other parts of different boroughs or other parts of the city itself, and it will encourage them to stay longer and to spend more money ultimately. So this type of project is directly good for the economy because people that are walking and using public transport systems are generally spending more money than those in other forms of transport. Uh, and the cost-benefit analysis of that really points out that this system does pay for itself over generally short periods of time. The other word that we, uh, we introduced to the project, that, that it should be integrated. It should be joined together. So this idea that we can provide a single information system across multiple modes, uh, products and different environments. So it is co-planned, designed and delivered as one system that it presents itself as a, as a seamless uh, information system to improve your experience. And that will, over time, encourage modal shift from, from car use, from taxi use, to walking, and even actually get people out of the subway if they realize it's actually quicker to walk uh, from A to B. Um, and ultimately, more people on the streets means safer cities, means more interest cities, more convivial cities to actually you know, walk, sit in, and be in. So, Really, wayfinding is becoming at the heart of a city's economy moving forward. Now, wayfinding systems can't do everything, so we had to pin it down to three functions, and these are really simple. One is to give you an overview to orientate yourself in space. Secondly, to enable you to plan your journey from one point of the city or one destination to another. And thirdly, to direct you along that path 
um, along your journey through a sequence of streets and spaces to your final destination. And we wanted to design information products that, that do those three functions. And we also thought that the system needs to be extendable. We can't just design for on street use. We live in a world that's uh, you know, very much digitally uh, enabled in this, this day and age through computer use, mobile applications, uh, smartphone applications. But we've got print and we've got people. Now, they're all part of the wayfinding experience. But at the heart of this is a set of design resources that we can use to develop products and services for any of those medium or particular channels. But starting with pedestrian systems, the skeletal framework enabled us to hang off, you know, kind of the close, the rest of the system, if you like, through mobile print and people-based services. And we also looked at a system that we could extend geographically. So, yes, we're looking at the city scale, but we're designing for each and every borough, and within that, the various districts and the neighbourhoods and the branded spaces. So we're not designing to replace everything, but just really to get people to move through the city, its boroughs, its districts and neighbourhoods through a single system. And what we wanted to do was, in designing this, to look at very closely at the city's urban structure itself that's made up of a series of nodes, paths, which are the streets and the avenues that intersect, and the spaces that show up within that structure itself. And what we wanted to do was start to think about developing a system that could reflect both the organic street pattern of the city as well as its grid layout that you see very much in Midtown. Um, and to do this, we started to think about a series of products that could grow in scale relative to the size of the spaces you're in. So, for instance, if you're on a narrow path on an avenue or on a street, you would be greeted with and would be using a narrower product. And the size of this product would grow relative to the size of the space you're in. So you get a bigger aperture, a bigger view in a major space, and you get the mapping area to cover the entire neighborhood, for instance. So what we wanted to avoid was sign clutter and putting the wrong size products in the wrong type of spaces. So it's all scaled to reflect the view in front of you, basically. And there's a core range of products, a path product on the left, a local area which sits into a kind of intermediary size space, and the neighborhood product there on the right, which is the larger, larger product, and then a finger post, which really is just to get you to that final leg of your journey. Um, but we're introduced mainly map-based products. These are double-sided uh, products in their own right. So all the maps are repeated on each side. They're interesting, as I'm going to explain, they're designed to be heads-up or forward-facing to mirror and relay the view in front of you. Very simple. So the products, and you'll see here how they grow from a simple path product, narrow product, giving you the, the orientation up and down a street or, a, or a, uh, an avenue through to a, an area product through to the neighbourhood, giving you the wider overview. Now, design is easy, that's quite simple, he says, but it's the design development behind it which is the real trick, which is the real success of building a project like this. And that involves looking at what we call information planning, the content and the data behind the system, the mapping scale and orientation of the information, the identity of the system itself, the graphic parts, and the product design. And then lastly, how we plan and place the products within certain streets and spaces, all to an agreed network of walking routes, of bus routes, of bike share routes. So that's very much uh, the science behind a product placement. I'm going to talk you through uh, how we built the system now. Um, we've taken very much a user-centered approach. The design is all based on evidence of what user needs are. So. Um, Key to our kind of uh, design expression has been talking to real people in the street environment to find out what they need and how they, they interpret information. We're also very closely at best practice, some of which I've shown you earlier. And as I said, we've been testing ideas with the public throughout the process. And this included uh, the idea of forward-facing maps, for instance. And quite interestingly, uh, the research showed for forward-facing, there were three options for New York. Uh, uh, standard north up map, a, a grid version of that, which is grid north, which is not true north, it's about 12% out of true north, and forward facing. And the, and the figures we got back from testing on the street is that nearly everybody prefers to see information relayed for them in the, in the way they're facing, the way they're orientated within the street environment. So the information literally mirrors the view in front of you. 
And we went through a whole process then of gathering data and information and developing rules around how we select information and how we apply it. So this is really the science behind what appears on the information products. We generated a hierarchy of information. This was all agreed with uh, stakeholders, uh, the development partners in, in the pilot areas, and not least with DOT who guided us through this process as well. We ran workshops and stakeholder events to generate content for the information system. And we went through, as, as, as Kerry alluded to, developing criteria for the whole neighborhood naming and district naming of the, of the system. And this is the first time, really, it's ever been pulled together for the entirety of New York City. So these are all the kind of building blocks. Now, I'm going to hand over now to David Figueroa of T. Charter to talk through uh, a little bit about the mapping database, which where it pulls all this data together with the geographic information uh, to present the system. So over to you, David. Thanks very much, Mike. Just let me make a check that I actually have seized control of the screen. Um, although I can't see that that's happened. I think everybody's hearing me, but uh, I don't know if somebody can... Uh, let's see here. I may have to click on the Go to Webinar Viewer and then press a button. You there now, David. Do you hear me? Yep. You do hear me. Okay. I see what's going on. Pardon me, but uh, let me begin. Thanks very much for your time, everybody. Um, as Mike's mentioned, our job on this fantastic project has been to digest the specification that emerged from the expertise of CDID, the, let's say, the fantastic planning um, will there is at the New York City Department of Transportation, um, the graphic designers pentagram with their experience in New York, um, and then us to start to commit that information into a GIS database. And it was recognizable from the start that there was going to be a need for quite a lot of products, let's say mapping products, heads up products, um, not just of one type, but of many. And once you start to represent the same information on many different products, a GIS database has proven to be quite, quite useful. And so in that process, we've needed to see what raw materials have been there to start with. And fortunately, New York City has an ambitious GIS program across most of its departments. Uh, that's coordinated by its IT department, who maintains uh, a variety, a broad variety of different data sets, which we looked into to see which ones would be most relevant for um, generalizing and deriving into the wayfinding database specification. And so in that process, uh, we needed to spend time with DOT and look through the different sources, find out which of those were quite up to date and quite current, um, which ones were not so current, may have been produced for a specific project or a specific um, instance, and then look into, of course, the developing wayfinding specification to determine which of these sources we were going to then start to hone into the database product. Um, this is being designed to be a corporate data asset that is linked to the IT data resources of the city of New York. So it's not built to be in isolation. Uh, although it is built very intimately wired into the wayfinding specifications, uh, which will fit all products that emerge um, in different transit modes and um, let's say also all the uh, across the entire geography of New York. So there are a lot of aspects to take into consideration when designing a project like that, but we can say that our experience is very clear that just using drawing files for a project that is this ambitious uh, really falls down quite quickly. Um, just to speak quickly about legible London and indeed um, a product regime which was already underway in London uh, quite some time ago. I think at this point there are over 25,000 unique map products, many of them heads up or face forward in nature and all these are today being driven from the same data resource which was developed through the Le legible London in initiative. 
These sources then, uh, T. Carter used, and the team as well, to um, start to mold using the rules that were developed through the, uh, let's say, through the wayfinding graphic specifications. Uh, in, in a way, the slide you're looking at now is cutting to the chase and showing a swatch of data through Lower Manhattan, which is actually, as, that's, as, as we'll see, let's say uh, that there's a scale which we call the locator scale, and it's, this is showing an area that's fully developed after quite a long process of deriving, let's say, source information, generalizing that, uh, through the wayfinding specifications, the content specifications determining which buildings, which places of interest uh, are going to be there using purpose-developed fonts, which I think Mike will discuss some of uh, which have been tested for legibility and um, let's say design consistency throughout New York. Uh, and putting this into the GIS data environment ready to use for graphic products. Um, let's say this one area probably is going to have many hundreds of products once the system is fully developed. And these products are going to be at different angles, um, different product types. Some of them will be underground. And the data resource is intended to support all of these. It's also supposed to be designed so that if you update any of the information that's on this, that's in the database, it'll immediately be able to be reflected on new updates of any of those products. And it's a truly challenging exercise, but we're putting our best ingenuity and experience to work here to make sure it works really um, rather seamlessly and well for the city of New York. The mapping database then is in a standard GIS format as specified by New York. They use S3 GIS data, and so we're committing everything into that format, um, also using Oracle Spatial uh, to complement the S3 graphic information. Uh, for exports, let's say, into final mapping files, we're using Illustrator or PDF, and there, in almost all cases, is a requirement for some final touch up and finishing for each map product, but hopefully that's, in say in almost every case, that's a very limited amount of work uh, extracting most placements and symbology from the database as is. Um, there'll be some, say if we look at the range of products, almost all of them have two different maps on them. One is a more d detailed focus map Actually, I think I used the term locator earlier. I apologize for that. That's a term used elsewhere. But the focus map is a quite large scale map, which we think is used for most of the navigational needs that users have. But there usually is a reason to have an overview type of map, which is used to look a bit beyond where you are to see other places that are of relevance or indeed just to position yourself correctly if you've walked quite a ways without fully understanding where you are. In the case of, for example, the city bike bike share scheme, the overview map scale is indeed likely more useful for planning a bike journey as it contains bike paths and destinations further than the limited area shown on the large scale maps. Uh, this slide has jumped a bit, perhaps it was me who did that inadvertently, but this is just showing that we have a rather ambitious map production schedule then to get the full database out um, by early 2014. So we're well underway right now, um, moving across Manhattan and Brooklyn and areas close in that area where a lot of products and project schemes are well underway. And then moving out as we get later into 2013 and the final delivery early next year. I'm trying to get the next slide up, and I have it now. Uh, this is basic overview about what the processes are at play here. Of course, this can be elaborated on quite a lot, but we're trying to get a lot of material in in a short amount of time. So I'll just say that we're, we have dedicated teams to each of these processes, starting with source information, filtering that and deriving it into 
the specification that's been developed by the team, moving through uh, to testing all that information out in the field to see that it is indeed current, finishing up the database um, through a rather rigorous quality assurance, which the City of New York is intimately involved with, and then committing it to the database ready for use for all mapping products. I've mentioned these formats for delivery and extract, so I won't spend much time on that now as we've already covered that. And I'm going to give it back to Mike to go into more detail about the graphic standards that have been developed for this project. So Mike, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, David. We've worked very closely with Pentagram on this, and they've led uh, we led on setting the specification and Pentagram have, have sort of led on setting the styling for this. And the guidelines are in evolution across not just PED system now, but bike share and soon to be SBS and subway. And they contain a whole host of elements, uh, not, not all of which I can go into, but um, broadly we've adapted uh, Neue Helvetica, uh, and it's called Neue Helvetica dot now. There's been some minor adjustments to it. Um, the smart among you may realize, or the type aficionados may realize that we've added a dot actually to the uh, to the typeface literally but with it, it sounds that it's not frippery or uh, um, it is for good reason basically because we want to create a watermark of quality that the DOT can control so uh, at the moment the DOT has this typeface as the designers do the only people in the city that do so we can control the outputs and make sure that they're monitored and controlled in the correct way We've also been uh, taken on board a very neutral design palette to absorb uh, primary brands that exist, such as the subway system itself. So using a very neutral background palette and then adding the colors and, and other devices taken in from other brands. We've uh, aligned the pictograms with the typeface. Uh, it was an idea that we introduced basically to, again, give it some um, uniqueness to tie everything together visually, and we've been through a prototyping phase. We've also looked at ADA guidance. There was very little or nothing at all related to mapping in this type of product, but in terms of viewing distance, we've made sure we've accommodated as best we can in terms of exterior uh, freestanding products, viewing distances, and, and the guidelines therein. And that's conditioned the information set out in order of read within each of the products from the beacon that you identify at distance to a locator, which is my address to the direction to the map that you read at eye level through to the partner signature at the bottom of the product itself. And these are set with typographic standards and, and design standards used. As I said, we've been through a, a user testing process on street at various different stages and getting feedback and that's been fed through to rationalize and improve the design of the products themselves. Um, and what we've ended up with is the set out for the product with names, addresses of the street and area you're in, directions, uh, including subway information as to where, you, where you're heading to in terms of subway entrances, and then the maps themselves. And David's alluded to the focus map, which is the larger, larger map, uh, giving you approximately a five-minute walk circle identified at the middle there by the U symbol, but giving you the distance to the edge of that circle and walk times. They also crucially tell you where uptown or downtown is, uh, east and west. And off-map pointers with information also tell you what's adjoining the map that's slightly out of the site of the or area of coverage of the map, should I say. And then there's a more detailed overview map, which provides uh, approximately a 15-minute walk. And that provides local connections to other transport services. So quite quickly, you can see if it's easier to walk or to get a subway or even to get a, to get a bike. And the path product, the narrow product, literally takes you up and down streets and avenues. Very simple in its design, but again, giving you off-map pointers to things like the Empire State Building. It's amazing the number of people that can be stood almost a block away or virtually underneath it, but not know where it actually is. It's, uh, it's one of those anomalies or odd factors. And again, this shows you a bit more of the detail of the, um, the focus map with 2D buildings to reference you, the focus map in more detail. And picking up on greenways, cycle paths, uh, subway lines are included as well. And we've gone through our process of network planning for this to, to indicate where the products will be. And I'm now going to pass over to Aidan to he will briefly talk about the product design development behind this, the actual 3D dimensional design. So over to you, Aidan. 
much. Hi, Mike. Thanks very much. <laughs> Hello to everyone. Um, okay, our role, as uh, Mike's outlined, is to develop the uh, product family for the system. Um, and part of that uh, role was to um, also look at scale and context of, of uh, the objects in the street. And so we spent some time looking at existing furniture and looking at how, how the products would potentially impact on the streets. And um, whether they would be seen um, is an important part of it. So the heights and scales of this, these objects were um, obviously a big factor. Um, the uh, graphics is obviously leads to the kind of size of the, the objects, but um, heights and um, the beacon element was an important part of the um, overall intent. Um, our our uh, involvement with DOC kind of goes back quite a while. We um, actually developed the uh, street furniture system for DOT, so we're very familiar with the, the language that we want to kind of create for the system, and so um, that was one of the key factors for us is develop a, a language which was um, based on a, a self-finished materials, robust, transparent, and kind of minimal intervention. So um, I'll talk a little bit about how we kind of got to that um, got to that that point. But um, take control. So in terms of the objects themselves, we created a family of objects which, which Mike talked about, which have different widths, which um, depending on where they are placed in the city can be a narrow object or a wider object, so you have more space to kind of uh, populate. Um, but in terms of the breakdown of the materials, we have a glass or acrylic, which ended up being a um, beacon element, which kind of attracts the pedestrian to the element, and so you can see it from a long read. And then the uh, mats are placed on the back of glass. It's a vinyl print. Um, applied to the back of the glass, and this allows for um, the um, maps to be updated potentially in the future, so it's an easy replacement, um, which is obviously very important in terms of the maintenance of the system. And then we have um, steel edge supports, which are um, um, finished, self-finished in a shop being finished, and then at the bottom we have a, um, a, a ceramic panel, which is actually porcelain panel. We looked at some other options, stainless steel being one, and ultra high performance concrete. But the um, porcelain panel, which we um, actually got to in the end, was actually performed very well. It's a very low porosity um, material, and so the robustness of on the street, the the, um, the um, people placing rubbish up against the system, and um, various um, um, issues of the street. Make it this uh, material perform very well on the street. So, go to the next. Um, so, um, this is kind of an early sketch of the sort of modular system that you want to wants to go with, with um, with an express uh, structure on the outside. You want to uh, keep the um, one of the keys for the graphics was to kind of bring the uh, graphic right to the edge, and to get that very fine detail it meant we had to uh, not frame the system. So we actually went with a top and bottom frame system so we could take the graphic right to the edge of the structure and we could keep the, um, keep the uh, image of the product very clean. To get those that level of detail that takes quite a lot of effort. Um, and so the, the, the build-up of the system is basically a T-section where, where the uh, structure on the inside uh, holds the glass. And we want to leave a, a, a room inside the structure to allow for future proofing the object. So potentially, in, if, uh, if uh, we wanted to put digital information, for example, we were able to do that. So we left a, kind of a, a nice structural um, void inside for potential future proofing of the objects. And uh, to get this level of crispness of, in detail, it takes quite a lot of effort. So we spent a lot of time trying to uh, look at various edge radiuses, material testing. We went through a, a, a long process of, of, of trying to get those, those um, details right. It's very important to some, because it's, it's actually a very simple design, but to get that simplicity in, in the 
in the finished product is um, takes quite a lot of detail and effort, and we worked quite closely with the manufacturer to get to this level of detail. Um, this is just the detail showing the porcelain tile that we kind of went with in the end that I explained. Uh, it's, a, it's back to a stainless steel panel, but the, these materials are all part of the of the process that um, to test and and part of our, our our intent is to kind of really make sure that what we put on the street will last. So uh, and then this is talking about testing of the object and we worked with RBA to um, <coughs> to uh, make sure that the um, structures were, were fit for purpose and and the um, yeah into the actual element itself so here we are these are the first uh, pro uh, prototypes going into Chinatown which uh, happened last month. These are the structural elements of the uh, frame system and these go into the ground as as the, you see the actual structure is actually expressed on the outside and then the glass just drops in on into the frames itself. The glass is, glass is their final graphic which is applied to the back of the glass as I said and then at the top we have this the acrylic beacon which uh, creates the um, kind of Illuminating factor for the for the for the um, sign itself. So I can hand back to Mike at these. But these are just the uh, first prototypes that are in the street now in Chinatown, and we have to be able to roll out many more. Um, as you see on the base panel there, that's the uh, porcelain panel. So we wanted to create a, a palette of materials that um, express the, the quality and also the robustness of, of uh, New York City streets and, and uh, hopefully we've created a product where we think we've created a product that will really last and uh, go on into the future for many years and is able to be updated so as I said it's future proof for uh, new technology and um, uh, other potential um, future needs. So Mike, I'll go back to you. Thank you. I mean the idea there that I think, uh, thanks very much Aidan, was really to introduce beauty uh, with function and that's beauty in function itself so how can you create something very robust very simple that, that that feels and speaks of the city itself so it doesn't feel like it's just been parachuted in from somewhere it does resonate with the quality and architectural quality of the city itself and fits comfortably yet it is beautiful in its simplicity I suppose and you're seeing at night how the, the light picks up on the materials a very high contrast for legibility and for detail. And let's put the multi back in this conversation because what we're talking about there are the key building blocks of the graphics, the data, the planning behind the system, the product design. It's all been put together in a way that makes it uh, the potential for introducing an information brand. The fact that this can be extended to cover every product, every transport product that covers every stage of your journey. So we can build out from this pedestrian system to bike share, the subway, the bus, to include not just the other modes, but other medium as well. So that's what we're now doing. We're looking at taking this through from, as I said, the skeletal framework on street, to now looking at the other modes. So we're evolving an extended product range. So from the left there, the existing products that you see, the bike share products in the middle, blue one is yet to be designed but it's a, it's a larger interchange or transfer product through to bus stop information itself uh, and it all relies on the work that, that, that David's doing to put together the database so we can start to populate products no matter where you are in New York wherever you are in the five boroughs basically and this goes for bike share the fact that we've been able to turn out 330 odd maps very very quickly for bike share uh, as the first sort of extension to the system and now we're into looking at the select bus service and the bus system itself. And uh, here we're designing a similar product, but it will include uh, real-time information uh, with live information feeds as to where your bus is, as well as new information types to show you route maps and how to transfer between one form of transport and another. And again, we're taking a similar principle to size the various products relative to the information that, that you need at a point in your journey. 
uh, we're not using a sledgehammer here, one size fits all, it's the reverse, actually increasing the product relative to the degree, degree of transfer that, that you are uh, or, or, or you could do in a particular location. So from major transport hubs where you can transfer to any, a whole myriad of different services, the products will be larger as opposed to what you see on a single route which takes you up and down a street or an avenue. Uh, very simple, again we've been going through a development process of testing and these are mock-ups that we've been using with, with various different people. Uh, it gives you an idea how the graphic language and flavor of the design is following through from the pedestrian system to the bus system. And this shows you kind of the detail now of the graphic language applied to bus route maps, literally to show you what route you're on, how far it is to your next stop, and you know, related walking times to particular destinations as well. Very clear, very simple, but again, I don't think any, we've seen anything like this in the US. We've also got very simple um, uh, timetables or what we call frequency diagrams. So these are edited out just to give you uh, very simple information on bus timing. Don't forget this works with the real-time information system above it. And we're also providing information about connections to services. So quickly you can transfer from other bus services and it shows the routes and walking distances. So here you can connect to five or six different, five or six different services within a two to three minute walk and it shows you where the stops are and what the bus services are. And then related to that, we're also developing a, a transfer map that shows you at a particular stop what exactly you can do in terms of other forms of transport from that particular location. So it includes other bus services as well as subway system itself. So it gives you the transport options in here as well, the East River Ferry, um, all in one easy to use map that will be provided on street. And as I said, these are going through a process of testing. And with in mind that this whole resource, and this is probably one of the last slides, is really it's about creating an open source system where the data can ultimately be shared by different information providers and used by NYC and Co, the business improvement districts and other technology providers to improve the quality of information right away across the trip chain. So a couple of concluding principles. You know, we've really thought about user needs and putting the user first and making the information as intuitive and as relevant as possible. We looked at that whole journey experience, so not designing at one particular point in the journey or just thinking about it as a single mode. How do we tie it all together? How do we glue it all together? Look at appropriate media. You know, it's not just signs, it's print, it's web. And we're creating the capability for the system to expand. And the other thing related to that, you've got to improve your streets and spaces in parallel to support the wayfinding function of your cities. And then, you know, it's not just about a system of parts, it's how you plan those as a joined up network. So it's a seamless network from point to point. And there's a myriad of benefits from improving the experience, revealing the wider office cities, encouraging exploration, you know, right the way through to encouraging repeat visits, longer stays. So people actually start to spend more and actually start to spend more as a public transport user and as a pedestrian, as a, as a, as a bike user. And at that point, we'll say thank you very much and open it up to the team. There are a series of contacts, Kerry Tyler from DOT, who you've heard of, and also Sam Coultrip in our New York office there um, will assist any further queries that you do have. And lastly, there's a website if you do want to hear more about the project or see more about the project, kentcitygroup.com. Okay? And I'll say thank you very much at that point and open it up to conversation. All right, great, thank you. Um, so our first question comes in from David. Um, why do graphic designers use a circle to describe a 15-minute walk shed when on a perfect grid the actual walk shed would be a diamond? Um, should I pick up on that question? It's, it's not actually a walk circle of equal time or distance. What we're doing is, and if you look, look at the maps uh, closely, it actually shows uh, on many of the maps three or four different timing points. So it's basically drawing your eye from the you are here to those timing points across the grid. And you've also got to remember that not all of New York is, is a grid system. So we tested this and we worked it through and we think by providing three or four timing points it gives you an idea of, of the walk times to the line. Okay? So that's, that's how that's come about. Cool. 
Okay, um, next question comes in from James. The signage plan is very nice. Um, can, can you guys speak a little bit more about integrating smartphone technology? Do you want to pick up on that one, Carrie, or? Sure, sure. So um, we, we've thought about it, and we're still, we're still talking about it. Um, we're, not, we're not really sure. We don't have an answer yet, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, eventually it's possible that we could work with a partner to develop an app. Um, you know, it's, it's really up in the air. I just mentioned, this is David speaking, that the database has been designed to be able to use digitally, let's say, uh, uh, in a web mapping application, um, so that that wouldn't be a hurdle at such time that some type of app or, or uh, say, smartphone type of use or implementation was going to be looked at. However, um, the design work to date has been done primarily for printed on street information, and so we would suggest that there probably would be some type of uh, design step if we were m moving towards apps to look at how the mapping and the other graphics hold up. Um, uh, but um, probably acknowledging that that will take place at some point in time. Yeah. But I guess I also want to say that we really do just want to focus on the core system for now. It's very important to us to keep rolling it out um, citywide and getting into other products and other modes as well. So that, that's our priority. All right, um, and this question comes in from John. The signs and graphics are terrific. How vandal-proof and fade-proof are the structures? Um, I can pick up on that in part. I mean, all, all the materials uh, themselves are self-finished materials. In other words, they don't require uh, high levels of maintenance. Now, any city system can attract vandalism. Um, but from experience of looking at other products elsewhere, we've selected the most robust uh, materials with longevity in mind. Not only that, the core materials can be sourced and are being sourced from you know, high levels of, of sustainable materials in terms of the steel and can also be uh, near enough 100% recycled. Now, the graphics themselves are printed behind glass and that's for very good reasons that we need to update the system periodically. Uh, hence, we've gone for that, that basic approach. So we need to update on a reasonably uh, regular basis, perhaps once every two, three years at least. Um, hence, the ability to do that quickly and efficiently. And you know, the, the graphic elements and the vinyls and the print-based materials are designed to be light fast for that time period. So we've, we've calculated that and made a best guess as to uh, the longevity of the products. Uh, in situ. All right. Um, next question comes in from Susan. Is the assessment of these mo uh, multimodal wayfinding systems an ongoing exercise, or have you built in periodic monitoring assessments for updates? Do you want to take that, Carrie? Okay. Sure. Sorry. Um, Yes, yeah, so we will be, DOT will ultimately be maintaining the base map, and um, we do have a database that, um, you know, will, will kind of alert us, you know, as we add additional content, um, you know, if the street network changes or we have, um, you know, a significant building is added or some, some other um, thing that we would meet our map content criteria then, um, you know, that will be flagged and then we'll consider, you know, whether or not to update the map at that point or whatever maps are being affected. So it is something that um, we'll be managing continually. Are you also planning further evaluation and of kind of use of the system? I think that's important and uh, uh, something that probably will be looked at. Isn't that right, Kerry? Um, I'm Sorry, for their use of the system, like for well, other in terms products? Of its, in terms of its success, you know, in terms of uh, user feedback, in terms of further development of products. Oh, sure. Throughout, I mean, throughout, throughout the process, we've engaged with uh, the public and citizens in, in, that, in that process. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, you know, we're getting feedback that, 
something isn't totally clear, I mean, I guess we could consider changing the graphic standard um, or improving it, but um, I think so far so good. But yes, I, yeah, we would be, I'm sure, open to making improvements based on feedback. All right, um, this question comes in from Arena. Could you please speak a little bit more about how you decided what to include and what to leave out of the focus map? It looks somewhat less dense compared to other legible cities projects. Um, no building outlines or stairs and road crossing in in indication, um, et cetera. Um, we, we really wanted um, to, a lot, a lot of the content in New York City is, you know, retail, um, you know, we have, you know, buildings with so many uses happening. Um, we really wanted to focus on just the information that would be useful for um, wayfinding purposes. So, you know, landmark buildings. Um, we do, uh, I think she was talking about like different structures and stuff. We do show like multi-levels. Um, <clears throat> so I guess maybe maybe some of the examples shown didn't get into that detail, but um, we are showing like how to access um, you know streets that pass under bridges, and um, we do show all the subway entrances in detail. Um, we we do show a lot of that. So from you know just a pedestrian access standpoint, we feel like um, the information we're providing is 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 very good, and then. Um, you know, I think a lot of the other systems might include more retail and other destinations that we didn't we didn't want to include because we didn't want to have to update the map so frequently. You know, businesses open and close here um, often, and it's just like too much change to deal with. So we're responding to that by working with our partners to allow them to use our base map to develop other print products or you know. Um, maps or maybe maps for their websites um, that um, can include, you know, whatever content they feel they want to provide, whether it's like galleries or restaurants or, um, you know, retail shops, etc. Okay, um, and this question comes in from Ken. Did you consider advertising on kiosks as a revenue source to build and maintain the system? Uh, no advertising. We really um, wanted this to be an, an information system, sort of, you know, not influenced by advertising. We wanted, you know, the maps to be on both sides. It really wasn't clear that there would be a way to, you know, to make these really as useful, use all the space available for pedestrian information. So um, one thing that we will consider in the future is we do have space um, below the map for logos, and so, for example, if you know a business or a real estate company or someone wanted to sponsor part of the system, we would show their logo um, on the sign. But that that would be the limit of of the advertisement. All right. Um, this question comes in from James. Do you have video or security cameras pointed at these signs to monitor use in vandalism? No, we don't. Um, what we've learned from other systems is that, you know, they really aren't vandalized that much. Um, what we've heard from London in particular is that people really respect the maps. So you get occasional stickering, um, and we do we do have partners in all of our areas that um, are helping to clean and maintain the structures. So, you know, if there is graffiti or stickering, um, they'll report it or other people can report it. Um, they can report it on our website um, or call 311, which is um, New York City's uh, information system. Um, and we will respond. You know, we have a cleaning contract and, and we'll respond immediately to, to remove the graffiti. Okay, and this question comes in from Elizabeth. Um, following up on monitoring, will you be able to track changes in user behavior? For example, how many more people are walking? Well, the city does regular pedestrian counts. 
Um, I'm not sure if we'll ever truly be able to connect that to um, the map, maybe in certain neighborhoods. Um, it might be more difficult in like Manhattan, for example, but maybe in outer boroughs. And then maybe in particularly, we might be able to learn um, or get you know, more information for transit ridership with our SBS products. You know, we might be able to figure out if those increase um, usage of the SBS system or other bus systems. That might be something that's easier to measure. But um, maybe in the outer boroughs, we could we'll be able to detect an uptick in walking, but um, you know, we haven't really thought about how to measure that. Okay. Um, this comes in from Douglas. Are any other cities in the United States looking at replicating this type of system? Um, I've heard that some cities have put out RFPs. I don't know, do you do you know Mike? Have you heard um, of any particular project? I think there's some interest uh, across North America in this sort of project. Um, we know, for instance, Toronto uh, are looking at a similar project, uh, Pittsburgh. I think you know, it's almost incumbent on cities to actually think more about uh, the walker, the public transport user, the quality of life in cities. So I think all this sort of work is of interest to cities in, in the United States at the moment. Um, my, my own take on this is that there's a lot to learn and a lot to uh, look at in terms of the principles, but I would hope each city or each place that is looking at a project like this designs in its own image, in its own identity, rather than tries to potato print or copy uh, exactly what New York have done in the way that New York has interpreted uh, its own city and reflected its own city in the design of the products rather than just trying to copy London. Uh, or London copying Bristol, for instance. Um, you know, so I think quality of place, quality of life, quality of well-being, um, all those sorts of factors are adding up to um, this type of initiative being of interest to cities. And you know, I think talking about evaluation and the business case, we know from work here in in in, in the UK, for instance, that you know this type of project has a cost-benefit ratio to it i.e. every dollar spent on it, you get a better return than virtually any other form of public transit or transit investment. It's very considerable. Um, typically, you might see a benefit ratio of one dollar invested. You get three back on, on building a turnpike or a road, for instance, or whatever. But uh, in this type of project, um, analysis is showing is up to twenty dollars back per one dollar invested. So it's very significant. So. I wouldn't be surprised if there was interest uh, across the United States and Canada to this type of project. All right, um, so that's actually about it um, for questions today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and switch back over to my screen, but um, I want to thank um, the presenters today, Aiden, David, Carrie, and Mike. Um, it was a really great presentation. I think everyone enjoyed it, and also Gabriella for um, organizing this presentation this presentation through the Transportation Planning Division. Um, so for those of you who are still in attendance, I'm going to go over a couple reminders on how to log your CM credits for attending today's event. So just uh, um, stay with us and I'll go over that in just a moment. All right, um, so first off, to log your CM credits for attending today's event, please go to www.planning.org slash CM and select today's date, which is Friday, July 12th, and then select today's webcast, which is Multimodal Wayfinding. This webcast is available for one and a half CM credits. Um, also, we are recording today's webcast, so you will be able to find a recording of this webcast on our YouTube channel. And um, with that, this concludes today's uh, session. I want to thank everyone again for attending. Thank you.